Hello and welcome. This is the Parents Who Think Debate Show. I'm Danusha, Danusha Molina Durban, and today is episode one of our first debate. Is having a favourite child okay? For the next three weeks, three parents will share their opinions on this question. Parents have been thinking about this old chestnut since well before you and I were born, and since before our parents were born. Parents Who Think is the next expansive brand chapter of what was called the School for Mothers podcast, and I hosted that for five years. Because PWT is a new format, I'll explain what you can expect then we'll get on to the debate. Now, like any debate, there are standard segments to make sure everyone has their say in a set framework. What my three guests say in these segments is up to them, but I want them to get equal chance to put forward their views. I'll always have three guests. Whatever topic we're debating, I guarantee they don't hold identical opinions unless they switch how they think during the debate. Each debate topic is cut across three episodes. Episode one starts out with an intro to the topic, followed by Dishing the Dirt, in which I do what it says on the tin before my guests arrive. I share what I think about the debate topic. This week, you'll hear my thoughts on the okayness or not of having a favourite child and my experiences with this. If you haven't listened to the School for Mothers podcast, the legacy show PWT has grown from, you might not know that I'm mum to ten brilliant souls. Six sons, four daughters. Are they all my favourites? I'll stick around for dirt being dished on that one. Still, in episode one, we move on to my guests, three parents from across the world. First, they share their life story with you. It's not me reading a bio. It's them in their own words describing a snapshot of what they want you to know about them and their lives. After you've heard who debate guests are, we go to the Say It in Six segment. Now this is six words that sum up their opinion on the debate topic. Once you've got an idea of where they're coming from, it's the P that fits me segment. The P's guests choose from are predictable, progressive, and polarizing. When we get to this segment, I'll tell you more. All you need to know for now is this part is like a declaration, a stake in the ground, which is why we close out episode one here. In ep two, the same three parents who think return to share more. The bulk of this episode centers around a segment called Get Up On Your High Horse. This is the core debate, answering, is it okay to have a favorite child or whatever debate we're having? Miss episode one and you won't get who's who and the context of their opinions. You'd also miss what my thoughts are on the debate. Having heard our three parents' thoughts on what they believe and why, in episode three, we get into a segment called If This, Then That, which is based on the idea that if we let this happen, then that will happen. Opinions are, how can I say, not necessarily about the subject itself. It's often about our projected assumptions about what might happen in the future if we allow something to happen or be done. This segment is about why this matters and what the impact of this is on us, on our children, and maybe on society. Before concluding each debate, there's a segment that zones in on the one habit guests have because of their opinions. I'm looking forward to hearing all these diverse habits. Now, when I say conclude debates, that's not because there's ever winners or losers in PWT, by the way. Finally, I'm scheming about PWT Live episodes, which I hope to put together over on the Parents Who Think a Substack. Now, this will be a chance for you to get involved and have your say on debates. 
Come join our Substack community where I'll share news on this and more. Put parents who think Substack into your search engine and it'll just come up. You can come over and join. I'll tell you a little bit about me in a mo, but for starters, it's enough to say that in my day job, people tell me their stories. That's corporate and deeply personal ones. And I keep them secret. Being a corporate secret holder is essential in our consulting company. In my night job, PWT, it's the opposite. I learn about, then share people's stories and the opinions that come from these. Now, the other day, someone said to me, Danusha, I never used to worry about saying something that would be taken the wrong way. But now, people are so careful and self-conscious. We've got to a stage, generally, where thoughtful, nuanced ideas get shut down. Hosting PWT is a test for me as I showcase voices with opinions that rankle and probably even offend me. I'm not always going to be able to stay unhooked and untriggered when people share things I'm offended by. The upstart in me, for instance, can't be predicted, but it's there. I mean, I'm sure it is. The righteous, I'm right person lives in all of us somewhere and can leap out from hidden places we thought we'd sorted or didn't know lurks. It's our attachment to how we think things should be. Now you're gonna hear opinions similar to your own, perhaps. And I bet my 10 kids, you'll hear from people whose opinions you find frustrating, confounding, and even obnoxious, including me as I promise to show up as the flawed, disagreeable person I can be, whether you chime with or disagree with my opinions. Parents who think is a place for scrappy-edged, imperfect humans and our contrasting and contradictory views on hot topics, together in a diverse community. You won't agree with everything you hear, and that's exactly the point. Now, one last thing. If you're uncertain about what you think, you found home. Expect debates where I'll share my uncertainty and even indifference. We don't have to be sure of what we think. Now, this might be the first time we've met. For those of you who know me, skip forward a minute. You just might not want to listen. Here's a snapshot of me in stats. I've advised on strategy and leadership in 142 boardrooms over two decades across five continents. Spent more than six years pregnant, birthing 11 children, 10 living. Consulted to more Fortune Global 500 companies than the Times Elon Musk shed tears over a rocket launch. I've expressed milk in 17 company loos and restrooms. Written two books in the last three years on parent identity. Changed 42,707 nappies. Recorded over 404 podcast episodes over the past five years. Lost 9,315 nights of sleep and still counting these. Won zero business awards, but supported nine others to clinch theirs. Tried every childcare solution known to humankind and still find it impossible. Mentored five founders to secure more than 57 million pounds of Series A funding. Battled with teams at least 2,688 times and received and given hundreds of thousands of cuddles just too precious to put a price on. If you want to know more, pop over to read my wanky day job bio on denishamelinadurban.com or find me on LinkedIn to connect if that's your thing. For my night job, it's all over on the PWT Substack. 
how about this? Is it okay to have a favorite child debate then? Should we get to that? Now, depending on who you listen to, favoritism is either likened to a form of cancer that runs in too many families or it's special treatment that's a blessing helping ensure healthy kids and healthy families. The effects are perceived either as deep lasting and dire or as something undeniable because pretending favoritism doesn't exist damages whole families. We'll hear if favourite implies parents like one child more than others and prioritise one more than these others. Then there's this. Do all parents secretly have favourite children? And our kids know it, whether we admit it or not? Or the idea that no parent should ever use the word favourite? Or is it that what matters is that all kids have their turn at being the favourite? That favouritism is fluid, where all kids have their fair share of the special treatment? Now, there's one occasion that especially brings to the surface the issue of fave kids. Will writing and reading. Now, Will is a person's final say in who benefits from their assets after they've gone. In some cases, it's the final word from a parent to their child. When a parent dies and they leave an estate, how they divide that estate can often show in concrete ways how they feel about their children. One child is left the commode and a set of encyclopedias. The other child, the two million pound house. Difficult to not come to the conclusion one child is favored over the other, right? The dirty little secret of parenthood, if it's that, gets confirmed. The point here is this, is it okay to have a favorite child? Okay as in, right or wrong. What are the consequences of having a fave? Is it so bad to acknowledge to yourself that you have a special place in your heart for a specific child? That circumstances mean you shared something together or you simply get along with them at a deeper, better level. That this child gives you, as a human, something another child doesn't. That you like the child more than others. Of course, this isn't the full and complete list. There's a difference between internally acknowledging and accepting having a favourite child and not acting on this. How much is our behaviour affected by this knowledge? How does this impact our other children? It's all perception. We're not in control of what our children make of things and the conclusions they form because of their experiences with us as parents. Having said all this, let's move on to dishing the dirt, where I dish my dirt on the debate topic. Oh, this is such a tricky subject. (laughs) I just... Oh, I'll just get on with it. I mean, I was not the favourite child growing up. My adopted mum used to say that my parents had their name down to adopt a boy. They'd adopted one three years earlier and wanted a brother for him. They were in line for a particular boy baby and everything was ready for him. Everything, I mean, I know it was. Then a call came to say another family had been given their baby boy, but they did have a girl without a home. Were they willing to take her on instead? Mum recounted my adoption origin story as if it was somehow good. My adoptive family subscribed more to the you were an orphan narrative than the other you were a chosen child one. Beside my older three brothers, I couldn't do anything to become favourite. It was a playing field I, I just didn't see as one I could enter. I mean, if this sounds sad... Honestly, that's not my intended tone or my feelings. I simply accepted the fave slot wasn't open to me. I was circumspect and undistressed 
I got on with being the only girl. I made the best of less interest in me. I found freedom in doing me without what I saw as pressures and vigilance. Although it's much more nuanced than this, because I'm recounting my history as if my parents were aligned, it was my mother that was the one who spoke of her best affections for my boy siblings. My father tucked me under his wing quietly, and while not outwardly showing disagreement with my mother, oh no, he secretly had a soft spot for our time together. He made space for me, just us. Was I his favourite? Mm, I don't think he thought in those terms. I had his special place in his heart, and that's good enough for me. Later, I was married to a favourite child. Golden Boy, his mummy's favourite and another four-child family. He was the adult child with the most prominent successful career. It was painful to witness the advantages he got from being the favourite, but I'd be lying if I didn't acknowledge it made life easier. I didn't complain. He wasn't disliked for it among his siblings, but they vied for but never attained the top spot. His mother, though, set Olympic standards for the woman who thought herself good enough to marry this favourite. It seemed like the sun shone out of her son's backside, no matter how he behaved. But let's cut to my motherhood. You've heard me say I'm mum of ten, in case you're wondering. They're my biological children. I remember sobbing when pregnant with my second child, as I was so scared I'd never love that baby as much as I loved my firstborn. I had a fave child. It was my only one, until I conceived another. I was terrified there wouldn't be enough love to go around. I was wrong. Love expands infinitely. There's no limit to it. At least that's what I found. That isn't of course necessarily the case for everyone and I'm definitely not here to tell others that it should be either. But that's not the same as having a favourite. I love all my children. This is distinct from always liking their behaviour. I hope my children know loving them dearly but not necessarily always liking their behaviour are not mutually exclusive. Being mum of a brood of kids means I'm bound to have some I gel with more than others. Some enjoy things I also like. Some share a knack for the kind of humour that brings me alive. Some box me into the mother role and haven't progressed into knowing me beyond who I am to them. Some grew with me when I was barely out of childhood. Others, as my fertility has been closing with my wisdom on the rise... In other words, I was immature with some, wiser with others. That's not to say that my older ones had a bad deal. It's not as simple as that. And because my motherhood spans from my teen years to my midlife, it means I might answer this now from a different place than I might have done a while back. There were years when I had four sons in little over five years and never expected to be mother to a daughter. I cherished the specialness of my sons. But when my daughter appeared, I was astonished and ecstatic. That's Harriet, by the way. It was different than raising my boys, intense and healing. Luckily, I later birthed three more daughters, including Madeline, my stillborn daughter. And then a set of triplets, two boys and one girl. I've had one hell of a lot of practice thinking about whether having a favourite child is okay. Realistically, is it in our control to have or not have a favourite? Are we at choice in our feelings? Don't we enjoy the company or qualities of one child for one thing and enjoy different things in another? I think it's possible to cherish, adore and treasure each child for who they are. But that ultimately... We may find one child a soul match, or more than one child. I'm interested about my guests' opinions on having a favourite child, but also hoping to hear whether they were or are a fave child. 
it sets the scene and backcloth for how we are with our own kids. You've heard, I wasn't a favourite, so unsurprisingly, I whisper, you're my favourite, to my children a lot. It must be a past wound, however much it's patched over for me, to choose to do this for my own children. I've no doubt some of my children would say I don't mention they're my favourite. I promise you, I have during their younger life. But some of my kids, it just won't have been said enough or loud enough. Then there's those who say it's not what they care about. Are they masking or coping with anticipated rejection and say they don't care because of this? Or are they truly blasé about the whole idea of being a favourite? In this debate, you'll hear from four of my ten children. Three of them tell you they're the favourite. They explain why, they know this. Recorded independently, no conversation between them, it's info in the raw from my kids. You'll also hear from one of my children who thinks they're not my favourite child. This child also says why, and again, this was recorded solo and is unedited. To my other children who might be listening, you won't hear anything new. I'm not sure all my children have experienced the favourite child slot in their lives. Have I thought each one child is my favourite at some point? No. Do I have a favourite child? I'll reveal that in episode three of this debate. Now that's enough from me. Let's meet my guests. You'll hear them introduce themselves. I ask them to record a short life story, not a puffed up professional bio. Meet Peggy in Florida, Daria in Athens, and Jamie in New York. As you listen, by the way, to my three guests, think about what you would say if you were asked to tell your life story in 200 words. Hi. I'm Peggy Starnes. I'm 58 years old, divorced mother of four children. I have two boys, two girls, all pretty much grown, 36, 33, 30, 27 almost. Since I'm a seamstress, self-employed. I love being creative and sewing has always supported me when my kids were growing and allowed me to always be there to take care of them. I homeschooled them while they were young and I led a homeschooling group so that uh, I could always be sure to give my kids everything that they needed while they were getting their education. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. In the frosty backdrop of 1980 Siberia, within a family transition from science to entrepreneurship during the tumultuous perestroika, my story began. This unique upbringing shaped my path as a psychologist, an explorer of human psyche and an entrepreneur. Educational pursuits took me from Cambridge to the University of Japan, blossoming into a career with a leading multinational in London and Geneva. Amidst corporate achievements, I found love with a charismatic Greek, leading to marriage and three incredible children. Our journey weaves through doctoral studies authoring books, developing courses, and a kaleidoscope of cultures across five countries. Now settled in Greece, I am dedicated to nurturing a world abundant in love and devoid of violence, a testament to a life both vibrant and purposefully lived. Hello, my name is Jamie Newton-Knight. I am a married mother of four. I have two adult children and two young children, elementary school age. As a mom, I try to find different ways to find solace and peace. So I try to make sure that I incorporate some form of self-care for myself, which usually means I'm trying to find some quiet time in a corner so I can watch a movie or my favorite TV show. But as a family, we love traveling. And so that's a little bit about myself. I live in New York and... I don't do much other than spending time with my family and being a mom and wife and all the things. I'm looking forward to chatting with you and thank you for this opportunity. 
let's move straight on to Say It and Six. This is where my guests share the nub of their beliefs on the debate topic in six words. It sums their views up. You're going to find some of my guests have trouble with math. So what's your Say It and Six, Peggy? I don't think you can help having a favourite. I think it's something you just can't resist. Of course, you're going to have one that you're like, ah, oh, how did this happen? <laughs> you're a miracle, you know. Some straight talking from Peggy there. Here's me talking with Daria. I'm very excited we're having this conversation because I'm eager to hear your views on favorite children. And I know you have some strong views around this. So what's your argument in six words? Like say it in six for us. Inevitable favoritism, subtly influencing family dynamics. I think favoritism is inevitable in families. We are humans and we cannot not, you know, have a favorite. Later we hear where Daria takes this as it's not where I thought we might be going. Jamie comes in strong next. My say it in six is children shouldn't feel there are favorites. My thought is just, you know, parents should not make children feel that there are favorites. Even if the parent might have one, just don't make them feel that there's one. On the surface, it sounds like there's two for it's okay to have a favorite child and one against having a favorite child. Once we get into things, the whys and wherefores of this topic, you'll hear my guests are torn. Some are not as absolute as their say it in six suggests. Of course, that's not everyone. You'll hear how being fixed about an opinion sounds too. I came up with the P that fits me because we live in a time where it's become tricky to say what we think in public. The widely accepted narrative is that we live in divided times. People are routinely described as polarised, while surveys compete to identify divisions of our time. Oh my God, there's so many of them, okay? But here's a few, whether that's metropolitan versus traditionalist, people versus democracy, or anywheres versus somewheres. My interview with Katie Hopkins consolidated my thinking on who we platform, cancel culture, and why this happens. If you've not listened to episode 170 in my Legacy School for Mothers podcast, save that for a time when you're on a drive someplace or when you can grab a cuppa and settle in. Who we give voice to matters. We need to hear the opinions of people we disagree with and our children need to learn to coexist with and respect those with differing opinions from themselves. Do they? I grapple with this. I'm not alone. I know I'm not. Now, the P that fits me is where guests name whether they think their opinion is predictable, progressive or polarising. This is their view of their opinion rather than how they think other people will perceive them. Got it? Even that's sometimes tough to disentangle. You'll hear more of that in this first debate. Now, before we hear the P that fits today's guests, let's cover how those P's are defined. It's really basic for here. We're not getting too scholarly about this. I share them with guests before we speak so they know. So predictable, a commonly held opinion by lots of people. Progressive, a forward thinking opinion that possibly expands predictable understandings. And polarising, an opinion that's more extreme in relation to predictable thoughts on the topic and probably goes beyond progressive ideas. These opinions might also elicit strong response. Bear these definitions in mind as you hear which P my guests choose. Here's what happened when I asked Peggy her P that fits me. Which P are you? Are you polarising, progressive or predictable? What do you think your opinion is? Polarising, I think. Oh, you put predictable. I did. Predictable. So in the pre-recording form, you thought your opinion was predictable. Now we're talking, you think it's polarizing. I think a lot of people would resist this line of thinking that you have a favorite. There, you know, a lot of mothers would be deeply offended. I'm curious about the fact that you've gone from one extreme of saying that your opinion, in your view, is predictable. Not what other people will think about it, but 
your view is predictable. And now I think what you've done is flip it of what other people will think of you. Yes. Yeah. How others might perceive you. You've shifted it to polarizing. Yeah, I could see some people being offended, especially when it comes to the subject of motherhood. So many women will slide into this battlefield of, you know, arguing and fussing about, you know, it being more their ego than how they really feel. Or maybe some people hold close how they are really feeling and then publicly present a different yes. different face. So, Well, it's easy to lie to yourself. I've believed I have in the past uh, held on to some really crappy ideals as well. And it's easy to change your mind. It can be hard to put your finger on or identify the P that fits me. It's about disentangling what we think rather than what others would think about our opinion. I put it this way to Daria. In terms of predictable, progressive, or polarizing, where do you see your view? Yeah, put it as progressive, because I think that looking at the family dynamics, my mother could just look at me with her eyes without saying anything. And that was a lot of the message that I received in terms of harshness. And, you know, looking at it from the multifaceted perspective, I think it's quite new. Why isn't your view predictable? Is my view predictable? Well, it could be predictable for some of the advanced people, but I think for the majority of people, they would not talk about maybe the family dynamics. They would be just simple, like, no, it's it's bad for the siblings. It's damaging for the whole family. It's toxic. And that's it. Maybe it adds a little bit of depth, but it's not too far from predictable for some who are very advanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got you. Yeah. So far, we seem to have Peggy who thinks her opinion is predictable, but also thinks other people will think it's polarizing. And we've got Daria who thinks her opinion is progressive. At this point, it still seems like they're both saying it's okay to have favorites. Which P is a fit for Jamie then? I feel like my P is predictable. And I think that it's predictable because I kind of feel like I probably have the opinion that most parents have, like, oh, there's no favorites. It's like that the correct answer, right, is there are no favorites. <laughs> so I think that my oh, answer is predictable. I really adore that. Like, <laughs> so you're saying it's predictable because it's the correct one. It's what right. most people would think. Okay, cool. Right. That's the, that's the answer that most people would say out loud. Ah, well, there's a nice distinction, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Jamie brings a clear-cut opinion that it's not okay for children to feel there are favorites. But then she sideswiped me with this. Yes, I know people in my own friend circle who say, you know, yes, I do have a favorite child. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're not supposed to say that. And they're <laughs> like, well, I don't act on it. I don't let them see that. I was left wondering whether Jamie has a favorite or not. Or is it that she's just good at not showing who it is? Oh, at this point, I had no clue. So I'm curious about, oh, there's so much I'm curious about, actually. <laughs> I'm curious about blended families. Mm -hmm. You are a blended family, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So how does being a blended family and the favorite piece play out or not? How do you make sure that no one feels that they're the favorite? Because that's the way you're coming at this, isn't it? It's another layer of, of uh, a layer. I'll just call it a layer. In the end, two guests say their opinions are predictable and one progressive. Join me in episode two to hear when these three parents get up on their high horse to explain why it is or it isn't okay to have a favorite child. I'll leave you with a clip from one of my own children. Here's Tom. My name's Tom and I'm fourth born. How sure am I that I'm the favorite child? Well, 100% sure, and why? It's a feeling, it's a look that I'm given. It's the love I feel. It's the crown that I carry. Thanks for listening to this episode of Parents Who Think. If you'd like to react in some way to something you've heard, I encourage you to join the Parents Who Think Substack community or on our YouTube page, funnily enough, called Parents Who Think. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more valuable conversation from 
PWT. 